Hey guys, this is Wayne from Wayne's Kitchen, back at you on YouTube. Um, I'm coming at you today to do a video about the coronavirus everybody's talking about. Um, so, I just wanted to go over some basic stuff for some of you. I've seen a lot of people out there don't seem to really know anything and what's going on or what to think of or do or kind of surprised. Um, I've always kind of been a prepper, so I'm always more prepared than most for just about anything. Um, sorry, I haven't made any videos lately. I've had a lot going on in my life in the last year. Um, a lot. So, here's the thing. Uh, first thing I want to say above all to anybody out there. Do not get your news off social media. Not even the crap I'm saying. Okay? Go and get it direct from the sources. The CDC, World Health Organization. That's it. Even your nightly news misinterprets things and gets things wrong. Um, and on and on and on. Your friends post and stuff. Ooh, smell broccoli. You'll feel better. Um, with my wife's cancer treatment, um, I understand a lot of people feel bad about that when they uh when they find out about it so they want to feel like they can help in some way so they immediately try to um i don't know it's something in people they just want to be able to try to contribute try to help because they don't know how to handle the the feelings that that happen when they find these things out so a lot of times it's very misguided not very well thought out and never researched um so people will tell you things like, you know, oh, or eat, you know, eat a pound of mustard a day, it cures cancer, or smoke pot, it cures cancer, or eat broccoli, or shoot up this drug from Lebanon, you know, you can get on the internet. None of that crap works. Um, I'm somebody that when I'm presented with something new in my life, I do a lot of research, a lot, uh, especially serious matters. I'll spend hundreds of hours pouring over stuff, analyzing it to understand it. Um, and I know how to read, you know, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm an expert, professional, I'm not a doctor, I'm not any of that, but I'm pretty good at interpreting and reading, you know, uh, engineering, medical stuff, things like that. I'm pretty good at it. So, at least in my own small way. Um, so a lot of times, you know, you'll even some things sound like maybe they make sense. So I'll run into that rabbit hole for 20, 40 hours sometimes researching uh, to basically find out that it's all crap. Um, even when they're citing doctors and this and that, it's you find this stuff out all the time. And, and uh, it's the same thing with this coronavirus. Um, there's a lot of bad information running around. I've had a lot of it come my way and, uh, it's too early for us to know that much already anyway. So, and we're learning a lot day by day, leaps and bounds. Our scientists and doctors, everybody are working very hard on this, but, um, you know, some of these things, uh, I just, I learned, especially when it came to my wife's cancer that, uh, don't listen to people. They just don't know what they're talking about. Um, it's true. Um, you know, maybe if it's a Harvard professor, MIT engineer, something like that, and they're talking about a subject that relates to their field, okay, lend them an ear. Um, but talking to the average person out there, you know, they have good intentions half the time, but a lot of people take things, even professionals, from word of mouth. And me as an electrician um, in one of my trades and my experience level being very high at it one of the things I find a lot is that guys in our business and you know, considered professional electricians um, get a lot of in the woods information you know they oh my, my boss used to tell me this and and I used to hear this from my foreman, and this is how 
this code is supposed to be and interpreted and you know da 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 okay and I found a long time ago that it only took me a few times of somebody you know correcting me on something and educating me you know that well that's not right what he told you was wrong and I'm like okay show me I want to learn and I always wanted to learn I always strive to learn uh, it's one of the things I've done my whole, pretty much my whole life so I found out really quickly to go to the source and to actually research these things and understand why things like, let's say, an electrical code was created it has a lot to do with how it should be interpreted. Why was it created? What was the issue that happened that the National Fire Protection Act had to, you know, install this into the into the new iteration of code or something? A lot of times that'll help you really to identify you know, why it was what it is, how to interpret it. And once you do that for many, many years, you start to be able to, you know, write a lot of things off pretty quick when you hear them from people. Um, you still always try to keep an open mind to things, but you start to learn more often than not that most people are just talking hearsay that, you know, stuff they just heard. And they never really read about it or researched it or, you know, talked to an expert or did any of this kind of work. People like to regurgitate what they hear and without any thought of the ramifications of what that can do. Um, here's one instance with coronavirus, which I'm bringing up right now. Isopyric alcohol, IPA. Now, sorry, got motorcycles flying by. Um, the roads are clear, so everybody wants the speed now. Uh, so everybody's like, Ooh, get the 99%, 99% isopyric alcohol. That's gotta be better. It's stronger. Well, not really. Um, if you do the research and again, I tell you, don't hear anything I'm saying. Don't even listen to me. I'm an idiot. Okay. I want you to actually go do the research on this of what I'm telling you. Don't ever take anything for face value. Go and research it yourself. So in my research and understanding is that you don't want 90%. You want, you know, 75 to 80, 68, you know, 75 to 68 in that range. 70 is considered about perfect for killing viral germs um, and bacteria and different things. Um, a few different reasons is the water. It's the water that makes the, calc the catalyst for it. It allows the isopyric alcohol to sit on the cell longer um, because it doesn't evaporate quite so quick. 99% evaporates very, very fast, as you'd assume. Um, but this doesn't. So it gives longer surface exposure time to the germ. Um, also, the water helps as a catalyst to help it penetrate the cell wall. So the cell wall in the virus is a kind of reactive thing. And when you hit it with very concentrated alcohol and stuff like that, and it burns off so quick, what it tends to do is it has like a defense mechanism where it'll harden its shell, basically. And make, plus the alcohol not remaining on the surface very long just kind of burns the outer shell a little and yeah it can kill it but it takes longer and it has to be on it so let's say you put the germs in the bottom of a cup and you fill the cup with it yeah then it's got exposure time as it sits there but if you want to on your hands and you want to you know do this um, you don't want to wash it off you want to let it dry on your hand um, that's another thing uh, you want it to have that exposure time and you want to let your hands air dry. You don't want to dry them off with a towel right after you use it. Uh, any surfaces you clean, things like that. Now that's why in hospitals, this is what they use to clean surfaces. And it works. It really does. Um, exposure time is maximized with the correct amount of penetration for the cell. Once the alcohol gets in the cell, bye-bye. So that's that. A lot of people don't realize that. And again, like I said, don't take my word for it.
go read. If you're not doing this research right now, you know, sit down one night, spend eight hours. You know, if you're at home, the weekend's coming. Right now it's uh, Thursday night. Saturday's coming, Sunday. I don't know what your work week is, but on your day off, sit down and do the reading. This is the time when you should be doing that. We have a pandemic. You should educate yourself very well. This is going to be a long video, I warn you guys, because i got a lot of information to give you quickly. I'll go over some really basic, easy stuff first. Sorry if I keep looking down. I'm looking at myself on the screen. It's a force of habit looking at a face when you're talking instead of at a little dot on the edge of the frame. But um, So, here's something right here. Well, with our Start with the basics on masks. This little respirator mask is uh, an N. 95. This is a 3M mask. Okay. Um, I don't know if you can see that right there, but that's N95 right there. This is an ideal mask to wear. Works very well. Um, so this is a, uh, this is not, it gets a little oil, but it's not really a big oil producer. But here's the thing. The numbers, people keep asking me, well, what's, what's N100 versus N95 versus N99 versus P100 versus R100? Okay, I'm going to say, I believe any mask, I believe, do your research, any mask is better than nothing. And I actually saw somebody do this, which was a pretty good test. Um, see if I have one here. Uh, I think I have a lighter. I got a fan going right now, but the idea was you put the mask on, light a lighter in front of it. Well, that was the fan probably right there. Yeah, I can't even. The fan keeps blowing it out. Anyway, the idea was you put the lighter in front of the mask, and if you can blow it out, the mask probably isn't that great. Um, so anyway, I got a couple of them here. This is another nice little one from Home Depot. That's a Home Depot brand. Not that I'm endorsing them or anything, but it just happens to be where these came from. These are an N95 as well. They have this metal ridge on them. I'm sure you guys have probably learned a little bit about this already. So you put the mask on and you bend the ridge. You want to bend this ridge around the bridge of your nose. What you want is as tight a fit as possible. And if you can shave your facial hair, guys, that'll help. I've been cooped up and quarantined myself in my house now for over a week, longer than that even. So uh, I'm not too worried. I don't really need to wear this because I'm not actually going anywhere. I'm working from home uh, and schooling my son from home. So these masks, as far as the numbers go, is the particle penetration. So at 95, it filters 95%. That's how it works. 100 filters 100 percent if you wear a 100 kind of tough to breathe through especially these if you're trying to do physical work in these things forget it you know you will be you'll be passing out in no time oh uh, so i don't but here's the thing if you find yourself wearing this and you're getting physically exerted okay go outside away from people take the thing off and breathe fresh air for a minute get your breathing right get your oxygen going in you and then you can go put it back on go back in the store whatever you were doing and grab what you were grabbing um you know or whatever you were going to do that's another thing about shopping my little pet peeve right now so anyway that's that's that um if you go to like a P mask, well, that filters oil as well. And then there's R, you know, um, those designations aren't as important, uh, whether they filter oil or not, you know, yeah, well, who cares? It filters oil or whatever. You're looking for a viral strain filtering. So N95, uh, P95, all the way to 100. Um, those are you know, the better ones to use. Nurses use the N95s normally when they're, when they're doing uh, treatments and stuff like that. Surgeons, I think when they're doing surgery, I think they're wearing a, a, a 
100. Or something close to it, I think. Don't quote me. I could be wrong. Um, another thing I'll do more research on. Okay, so there's a few products here that, um, that can kill the germ. All right, so we've already kind of touched base on IPA. That's rubbing alcohol. Um, here's another one. Hydrogen peroxide at 3%. 3% will kill viruses. Uh, need some exposure time. Don't wash it right off. Give it time to kill the virus. Needs a, needs a little bit of time. But uh, it's a great antiseptic and it's believed to kill coronavirus. So um, I actually might even say coronavirus. Now, <laughs> here's another funny observation of misleading stuff on the internet. And I have even seen, uh, this, this guy had to have been embarrassed out of his mind, a doctor. And I actually looked into it. He's, he is a doctor. I wouldn't go to him. Put up a video online talking about how, you know, uh, coronavirus has been around. It's nothing new. It's all a scam. Blah, blah, blah. Look at the back of my Lysol bottle. It says kills coronavirus. This bottle's two years old. All right. Coronavirus is a family of viruses. Just like, you know, cats. There's a lot of different types of cats. You don't even know a Great Dane is a dog, just like a miniature Schnauzer is a dog or a Chihuahua. They're all in the same family, the canines. But we're not saying, okay, canine virus. So one day we're saying, okay, Great Dane canine, canine Great Dane virus came out. Call it SARS. Um, then canine Chihuahua virus came out. Call it MERS or whatever. Uh, oh, now canine... Uh, miniature schnauzer came out and that's COVID-19 um, COVID I always want to say COVID COVID-19 anyway um, that's how that works anyway so yes Lysol and, and a lot of other companies already understood what coronavirus was it's a family of viruses and a lot of their products already knew they kill SARS. They kill, you know, the basic coronaviruses that we know of. Um, this is a new strain. There's still a lot to learn. Um, but, you know, you're going to learn more about it as the time goes on. But we know certain things kill coronavirus. Like Lysol, alcohol, peroxide. And now we can talk about another product. Barbicide. Yes. Some of you may not know what this is, but the name is kind of a giveaway. Barbicide is actually uh, what barbers use. So you ever been sitting there getting your hair cut and you see them drop their scissors and combs into this little glass jar with blue fluid in it. That's it. Barbicide. Now, barbicide actually kills coronavirus. And this has actually um, been researched now. Well, we knew it actually worked against older strains of coronavirus. But now we actually know that it, um, well, it's no proof because nobody, like these companies, haven't got the germ yet to test on. But since it kills the other coronaviruses, Pretty sure it's going to work on this one. Again, nothing's proof positive till the research is done, but you know it is what it is. Now, other viral things that this can kill is actually HIV/AIDS, hepatitis. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of transmittable, communicable diseases, communicable diseases and, and uh, viruses. But so I'm going to talk a little bit about barbicide. This is not a spray it on your hand real quick, wipe it off, and go. Okay. Um, it actually does, hospitals actually use this for disinfecting too, by the way, and cleaning and mopping and doing different things. Now, they make a, uh, they make a wipe that can be used to wipe surfaces. And that can kill 
the known strain of coronaviruses before this one um, in about two minutes. This like this is concentrate. Okay, so you take, you know, the, you read the directions, you take like a shot glass worth of this stuff, and you dump it in like a gallon of water, and you get a full thing of herbicide at the effective levels that you want. Now, me personally, I mean, I got to read the instructions on this one, but uh, I pretty much uh, use distilled water for any kind of thing like this because I don't want to contaminate or affect the chemicals that are working by putting in other minerals and things like that. Um, unless it seems safe to use. And I usually do research on that too, because certain chemicals can affect the performance of things. So, and as a rule of thumb, I always add like 30% for a uh, time frame to things. So this particular barbicide and done, uh, actually put in is, uh, it's a product of King Research is uh, hospital grade stuff. Works really well on hard, non-porous surfaces. Uh, you're not going to wipe this on wood and you know other stuff like that, but you know, metal, you know, doorknobs, switches. You can even disinfect canned goods and different things with it. Um, my specific reason for having this, and I can wipe surfaces with it and do things like that. It does work. But at this dilution, like this into a, a water, um, requires 10 minutes of contact. Uh, that's not something you just got on your hand and go, I'm good. You know, so my actual usage for barbicide is a little different. Now I have a method that I do on the rare occasion I have to leave my house. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a prepper always have been and I prep for multiple different situations and one situation in particular is having to be trapped in your home whether it be viral or warfare or, you know chemical or whatever okay um, yeah I even have Geiger counters I'm crazy I guess uh, a lot of people think I'm crazy until crap like this happens and then hey you're the smart one right because you're the one sitting here with tons of respirators and you know i got full face respirators and i got hazmat suits and i got all kinds of stuff comes in useful right now doesn't it i also have protocols and plans in place for what's happening so that's where this came in so what i do with this is i actually have a kind of big plastic bucket thing that can be put in the back of my truck um in that as a airtight sealed lid um, so I can close it so nothing splashes around. I can fill it with water, put my barbicide in, mix it up. And if I had to go to the store, I wear my full gear. And uh, maybe sometime I'll post some pictures and videos of me all garbaned up, but I do. Um, yeah, people take pictures of me right now. <sighs> uh, I, don't, I don't try to go to the store at all unless I absolutely have to for something, but um, you know, just what it is. I don't trust somebody, especially somebody not making a lot of money, which most people in the retail industries and restaurant industries don't make a lot of money. And especially in now on times where things are tough. Um, if somebody got sick, there's a lot of people out there who would know they have the symptoms, but would want to hide them from their boss. Oh, I got a bit of a fever, a little bit of a cough and try to hide it because they want to keep making the money because they know if they lose their paycheck, they could lose their livelihood. They could lose their place to live. They could, you know, their family, blah, blah, whatever. And some people are just not very cleanly people, period. You know, they don't wash their hands. They don't, you know, I've got an experience with somebody that I know right now. It's like that, that I won't even associate with because, uh, I won't get involved in how I know them or in what part of my life, but they take a lot of very high risks. Um, since this has been going on, going out and eating at every fast food and restaurant, doing the takeout thing, um, and then trying to come back around me, um, going out and, you know, shopping with no gloves, no protection, 
Um, not even really washing their hands. I mean, these are the kind of people who use the bathroom and don't really wash their hands after they use the bathroom. Um, you know, on and on and on with that. So, and uh, just take a lot of risks. Um, I don't do that. Better safe than sorry. Um, so, I refuse to go out to the takeout restaurants, and I know it hurts their industry, but hey, I can't help it. I got to protect my family. I have a young child. I'm a single father, and I have an elderly mother I'm taking care of. And um, she can't. She's got too many conditions that would cause her to pass away from this. And uh, I don't want to take a chance. So basically what I was getting to is what I do if I did have to go to the store is I specifically target canned food. Yeah. Um, and what I do, because I can't exactly take, you know, a head of lettuce and throw it in barbicide that probably wouldn't be very good for me to eat later. But one good thing about canned food that I like is canned food is sterile almost always unless something bad happened in the canning process. So what a lot of people don't realize is how it's made, you know, canned food. Uh, the food is put in raw. It's not cooked in the outside of the can and then put into the can. It's actually cooked within the can. And I know a lot of us are used to eating fresh, good stuff, and that's great. But, you know, in a situation like this, safety is more important. I eat for sustenance, not for taste. And I'm a foodie, so you know I like to taste. You guys have seen my videos. I eat all kinds of stuff around the world. Very much like food. But when I have to, I can buckle down and eat for sustenance only. Um, and that's what I'm doing. So I still have plenty of food here. Um, I have a big deep freezer and everything full of, you know, meat. Um, I have some vegetables and stuff left and different things. And, you know, I've got a lot of stuff that I had before this whole thing went berserk. So I'm okay. Um, but also I have a very big stockpile of canned food, dried foods, rations, um, long-term storage stuff that you can store for, you know, 10 years or more. So, you know, I've got four months worth of food, easy four months, maybe six months. And if I ration even longer, um, so I'm not too worried, but let's say I had to go to the store. I want to, you know, I'm out of canned carrots. I want more carrots. Okay. So canned food is great. I have the bucket I told you about, basically a bigger bucket than normal. It's got an airtight seal. It was used in manufacturing, actually food grade. Um, and I have a top that goes on it and it seals with a big steel uh, locking thing on it and um, I was in the honeybee business and processing honey and stuff so I've had that for a long time and uh, it's perfect so fill it with water put the barbicide in it put the lid on so it don't splash around drive to the store um, now, the other thing I have is a metal frame basket, stainless steel basket. Um, it's just a handle basket, just like something like you would see at the store. One of those little, you know, with the handle you pick up instead of a rolling cart. And I can literally wear my, I wear my full protection hazmat. Everything when I go out, but at least coveralls and uh, respirator and gloves and uh, disinfectants with me and everything so I'm not um, not taking any risks but I take that little basket now there's a lot I can teach you about protocol about contaminants and not infecting yourself um, so one of them is yeah I'm wearing two gloves yeah I'm wearing all this protection but I'm I isolate so you isolate the contaminant to one point so when I'm doing what I'm doing, I plan ahead how the process is going to work. I use one hand to touch anything. My other hand stays in sterile condition. Um, so maybe I have my basket and I hold the handle of that. And then as I touch what could be contaminated, like the canned food, I grab it like this. Now, I don't know if the stock person on that aisle had coronavirus, was sick. I mean, imagine if this was, you know, um, 
a breakout of Ebola here, contaminating everything. Hemorrhagic fever ain't nothing to play with. Um, so I grab with this, this sterile basket I have, which I've already had sterilized, and my sterile glove. I take my canned food, the only hand I'm going to expose, and I'm going to be very mindful of this hand, of what it touches. I'm being very careful that this is the only thing I'm touching. <clears throat> now, remember, the number one finger on your and thumb on your hand, these are the things you're going to touch more than anything, usually these three. These touch everything. These are the fingers that you have to watch out for right here. They're the ones. Um, so you're almost always going to contaminate these more than anything else. Um, so this hand reaches out and grabs the canned food, puts it in the bottom of the basket. And I fill the basket with canned food. I go up to the register. I already have my credit card taken out, debit card. I'm not touching cash right now, period. I take out my debit card. I do my transaction. Um, that debit card does not go back in my pocket in my wallet because I have my clean hand that reached in to grab out my wallet, took my debit card out, which is now clean, and has transferred it to my dirty hand that has now put it in touch the little keys for the pin number that everybody else touches okay so this is contaminated so that card now instead of going back into my pocket goes right into the basket with the canned goods it's contaminated i don't touch it all right so then i take that and let's say i did my shopping if i have to make five or six trips back and forth in the store to get enough stuff to fill you know that's fine whatever take that basket out to my vehicle and I put it right into the Barbasol. That's another reason why I'm using a stainless steel grid basket. Um, and you can make a bag with holes in it or something. Anything the Barbasol can clean. And uh, usually hard surfaces. Um, so, you, you know, could be plastic. Could be stainless steel. Some kind of metal. Uh, stuff like that. Um, don't want to use cloth, cotton, things like that. I mean, it would probably work soaking it for a while. But um, just don't even bother. So I put my basket in there and with my clean hand, then I close the lid. Then, before I do anything with this hand, I take my alcohol, I put it all over this, just spray it down, you know, or peroxide or bleach solution, Clorox, you know, whatever, to clean this glove. Now, when I take off this glove, how do I do it? This is what you got to think about. Let's say you're going to take both your gloves off now and you add the contaminated hand. Are you going to? Grab the fingertips like this and pull them off. How are you going to take your gloves? Let's say you're, both your hands are contaminated. Well, a lot of people grab the tips or they, you know, put their, fin their fingers under here and they roll it off. Okay, contaminated fingertips, sticking them under here to roll it off is just rubbing the germs right up your palm and all over your wrist right here when you took that glove off. Now, you should be washing your hands immediately after you took the glove off. But the contaminate, you know, so try to treat everything as sterile as you can and watch where you're cross-contaminating things. Um, speaking of cross-contamination, just a little rabbit hole to run into on a side note. Um, so I was up in Massachusetts when this whole thing started breaking up there. And the, you know, order was put out that the restaurants couldn't seat people inside and they had to do drive, you know, drive up. Um, so I didn't want to do it, but I'm away from home. I'm, I'm from Florida and I'm, I'm originally from Massachusetts, but so I'm up in Massachusetts at the time. I was finishing up some work I was doing up there, um, for a project for the company. And as I'm coming back, I had my planes getting canceled and rearranged because of the, nobody was flying. So they're not going to fly me by myself back on my own private plane jet you know that's kind of nice right um so what i ended up doing was uh i stopped to see some family while i was up there who i know had been quarantined as well i had been very cautious my entire time but we ended up deciding to go out to eat one night because uh just wanted to do something nice for them whatever but i know that this was the last time i ate out um just what it is man so we go out to a local place and now this is a small town in mid Massachusetts. It's not, you know, it didn't have any coronavirus patients showing up yet or anything like that. So, you know, 
probably better off. But the problem I saw was, and I understood, you know, these restaurant workers take some very minimal health department standard stuff for food prep and things, but they don't get a lot of real infectious disease training or bloodborne pathogen or things like that, right? So they don't have this kind of this kind of knowledge. So they think they're doing well. They're trying. So they had uh, one waitress basically coming out to the cars. Um, you could call ahead your order, which is what we did, um, and then pulled up and waited in the parking lot for them to bring it out. And uh, first she comes out and she brings a clipboard with the receipt and a pen. And I watched her before she got to us, and I had seen this other places happening too, um, going from car to car to get the signatures. And every time writing the signature with the same pen. So she would hand the pen to this customer at this car. They'd take the pen in their writing hand, which is the most common hand they use. Also the most infected fingers on the probably placement on the whole body. All right. And they write. So they cough. <coughs> this is their hand. <coughs> Cover their mouth. Then they grab the pen. They sign the receipt, they hand her the pen back. She takes the pen back and has the clipboard, goes over to the next car to get a signature, hands them the same pen. Um, and phew, everybody's using it. So she came to me and I explained it to her. Uh, she figured she's right, she's wearing gloves, she's wearing a mask. Uh, when she goes back in, she immediately sets down her pen and clipboard and she goes and puts squirt some hand sanitizer. And remember, you're touching the top of that thing, right? To squirt it in your hand. Pump, pump, pump. And then where's the hand sanitizer cleaning the surface of that? So you took a contaminated hand, you touched the top of it, then you squirted some in the left hand, then you started, or right hand, whichever you did, and then you started cleaning, right? So now that infected surface is up top. So later on, maybe that night you pick up that bottle to go set it somewhere, and you're not even thinking you touch the top, and and then you've got the germs back on you again, and you thought you were sterile. This really happens, people. So I explained to the girl very nicely, and she understood immediately and realized I'm sure they probably put some kind of protocol in place. A good idea would have rubbing alcohol and just dropping the pens and the alcohol when they come back in, use one at a time, or, or ask the people to bring their own pen or something, because then you just hold the clipboard and they just go with their pen and, you know, whatever. Um, so that was that, um, uh, I took my own pen out, said, no, thank you. And signed real quick and even cleaned the head of my pen. I put a hand sanitizer on right away and let her walk away. Uh, food came out. Um, we weren't fully prepared to disinfect the bags and everything. So we took a risk that night and we ate. Um, but I haven't done it since because you know the food prep to the cook to the runner to the packager to the to the one doing your receipt to the there's just too many links in that chain that could fail and fail badly um receiving the food stock comes in and you know the packer who was packing those boxes the day before for the shipping coughing in his hand was touching the boxes and comes into your store and then you're handling the boxes and moving them, not thinking nothing and boom, 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 boom. Uh, that's the way my mind works. So, uh, that actually happened. And since then I've not gone out for anything. Um, but like I said, if I had to, that's a method. Barberside works well, 10 minutes of exposure. I'd leave it in for 13 to 15. Usually if you're driving home from the store, you're probably, you know, at least 10, 15, 20 minutes from your house. So maybe, um, and then, uh, it has plenty of time washing around back there as you're turning corners, splashing around. Uh, another thing I would do is in the reserve tank where the barbicide is, is you can put a bubbler in there, just an old, um, uh, air bubbler, you know, you'd use for keeping fish alive. You can put that back there, put it down to one of those little stones down in the bottom of the barbicide tank. And that'll actually get the barbers moving around the whole time too, aerating it and moving it around. 
Um, I haven't done a ton of research on it, but I'm pretty sure that's probably a good method too to keep the barbersol flowing over the surfaces. Um, but again, I honestly, I leave it in for 20 minutes. So I put my canned food in there. I expose it for like 20 minutes, double the time that's recommended for killing viruses. And now it's time to take them out. So I'm wearing gloves. I'm doing everything still like it's still infected. I take them out. I rinse them off in the sink. And then I soap and water clean. Them. Now at this point, the labels are probably coming off. Now there are some cans, though, different companies that don't have the paper label anymore. They actually have it printed on the can going around. That's cool because it doesn't well, get wet and fall off. But if it does, don't fret. Um, you can do mystery cans. It's always fun. Uh, but the better option is just to have a Sharpie or a permanent marker and just mark the can for what it is. You know, carrots, peas, green beans, potted meat, whatever. Um, and again, you can have meat in those cans. It could be hams, could be chicken, could be tuna, could be, you know, whatever meats, uh, corned beef, whatever. And uh, so, yeah, I recommend always keeping a stockpile of canned food around and even though you may not want to eat it when you don't actually have to, but rather than waste it when you, you know, you're getting, you got a couple of years on it. So when you know you're getting near the expiration, you know, just go through a routine of going through that food and buying new cans to replace it. And then that way you don't waste, you know, or give it, donate it to charity. If you don't want, they'll eat it. They're happy to eat it before it expires. Of course. Um, and just restock your cupboard with all new cans. You know, spend a few hundred dollars or a thousand, you know, it's however, how much of a prepper you want to be. I recommend at least 30 days worth of uh, canned food. And so you get to think you're going to want like a canned meat because uh, you could go without power. So you might not have refrigeration. Uh, you might not have gas. You might not have a way to cook. You know, you might not. A lot of things can happen. So at least a 30-day supply of canned food is good. So you figure a meat per day and then a couple vegetables at least. Um, and that'll get you through a while. And that's that'll And then however many people you got, multiply for how much you need to feed a family. And you can test that just on a couple of meals and see how much everybody eats. And then multiply that by 30. And uh, But yeah, I actually prefer even more actual uh, food so um, anyway that's that for that let me step on to something else okay so a lot of you guys also know to get the gloves so I've got a lot of different gloves um, I always have little pack ones too I can throw in my pocket it's like the Home Depot special ones um, I got more other places and everything I got some pretty heavy duty thick stuff um, you can get very large ones, matters of your hand size, uh, something comfortable. I prefer the non-powder, non-latex stuff, um, better with chemicals and things. Um, here's another thing you can get. Now, this ain't a hazmat suit, but this will work. So, this is a painter's coverall. And dealing with a virus like COVID-19, you know, these are not really meant for more than like a one-time use it's kind of a dry particle thing but uh this is a uh, it's a barrier so you know if you sit in a chair and you're wearing this and you do get you know cells on you know the viral cells on your uh clothing the germ this would kind of protect you from that and you can just wear the full coverall suit it's got a hood you can just unzip it drop it off burn it throw it in the garbage, whatever, um, however you want to do it. Uh, so there's another, this is one of the Home Depot brand ones. Now you can go out and spend the big money and get the uh, hazmat suits. You can get them anywhere from matters what level and grade you're looking at, but um, you can get everywhere from a hundred bucks to you know, even a little cheaper chemical suits and stuff like that with sealed seams and all that, all the way up to, you know, a thousand dollars with a breathing system attached to it and stuff like that, a couple thousand even, uh, hard face shields and something like you'd see on like the Ebola type movies that you've seen, like Outbreak and stuff like that. Um, you ever watch Outbreak? You can buy a suit like that. 
um, and you can get the respirator part with it with the filter where the tube comes off and it goes around to the back it's, uh, and then you have your filter behind you and it's also you can get forced air with the little motor that runs and it actually pumps air through which makes it easier to breathe when you get the ventilator masks it's nice to have the export on it because it helps it not keep so much heat and everything around your face you got your your actual cartridges which are the filtration um, then you have a pre-filter you can put on remember it's two filters uh, better to have the pre-filter and the other and then look read the directions how long does that cartridge last with normal use and then give it a take how much you breathe you know um, if the thing's good for 40 hours you're good for 40 hours um, and remember you don't have to wear it the entire time you know like you don't have to leave your house and wear the thing while you drive to the store walk around the store get back out drive home and walk around the park with your dog or whatever wearing it you know um, with this particular virus you don't need to wear it unless you're you know near people or in a place where you know wind could be blowing somebody's cough or you know particulates from their well, or water molecules from them sneezing or whatnot so if you're driving in your own car you know you're pretty much safe nobody's been in it just you you don't have to wear anything um, keep your area clean um, disinfect your doorknobs and your steering wheels and your shifters and all that stuff you know just keep cleaning it even if you think you were a hundred percent safe clean it anyway wipe it down with alcohol you know alcohol is pretty non uh, harmful to most surfaces so you don't really have anything to worry about with alcohol now rubbing it down with bleach it can do damage to things or any harder substances um, if I was gonna try to kill off a coronavirus germ on like a wood railing on my balcony or something it's probably gonna do some damage definitely to the stain and things like that but you could pump spray muratic acid on it I'm pretty sure that'll kill anything including you uh, so anyway that's that's the idea uh, so this is just a couple things that'll help you out when you go um, again your reusable part half face or full face respirator take off your cartridges wash it down soap and water alcohol scrub it real good um, having disinfectant alcohol wipes is really really a good thing because you can actually with a 70% alcohol wipe you can just while you're wearing it wipe down the mask in case any you know little particulates got on the mask and uh, that'll kill off whatever's there um, but yeah that's pretty much how it works face shields if you only have a partial or even even if you're only uh, working with one of these you can get a face shield it's just the headband part with the drop around face shield for like grinding metal or something not the welding one because you're not going to be able to see through it but just the regular face shield for like doing grinding and stuff like that it lets air flow through and everything but it's going to keep you know somebody cough directly in your face or something you know it's keep stuff from getting near your eyes because remember this virus you know your nose your mouth and your eyes so you could be wearing this part and somebody coughed right here or sneezed and so that's why I got the full mask and the full suit with the cover and everything because I don't take a chance um, so again my biggest thing though is get your information from the source and from the credible people the CDC World Health Organization you know, I don't care how good your local news is. I don't care how smart your friend is. Don't trust anything. Um, get it from the source. The symptoms. Uh, CDC up on their website and World Health Organization has a lot of great data if you actually sit down and read it and take the time to educate yourself. Um, I mean, the World Health one has the ticker, which is telling you the virus count each day. So you can see it if it's growing in your area. If you're in the state of Florida, it'll tell you how many new infections that day, how many are current, how many have you know, concluded, how many passed away, what the change is. Um, you can look at the entire country you're in, all over the world. Uh, another thing with the CDC, it's still at, they're posting 
uh, the case studies. So, you know, of course, HIPAA laws, I mean, there's no personal information. It's not like Joe Schmo, you know, he uh, had this happen. But it's like, you know, male, 42 years old, uh, history of diabetes, type 2, blah, 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 you know. And uh, it'll say, you know, progression, first came in with symptoms in the hospital at this time with a sore throat and a headache. Uh, had a scratchy throat a few days earlier, blah, 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 doesn't know of any exposure, he does, you know, know his wife was sick or was exposed in the travel or whatever. You can read the individual cases and what the doctor showed as the progression and symptoms and what was happening to that person. Also looking at the people who didn't die from it and seeing the people who, you know, maybe went to the bad place but got back, you know, they got the pneumonia, they went to the hospital, they were in, you know, bad shape, but they came back. And my thing is I'm trying to figure out when I look at these cases of a 30 year old man who, or 30 year old woman who, who was in remarkably good health, was an athlete, you know, had no medical conditions or problems and they died of it. I'm particularly looking at them. And then I'm looking at the ones, you know, you were 70 years old. You had all the conditions that should have killed you, but you lived. What did you do differently? You were diabetic, hypertension, you, you know, all this stuff. Uh, you had, you know, M, uh, uh, <laughs> that was the name of it, asthma. You had asthma um, and you lived like, okay, what did you do differently? Now, one thing I've, I've watched, some of these people post their stuff on YouTube while they're going through it, uh, and afterwards, um, I don't just believe anybody who jumps on YouTube and says, I had coronavirus, and I survived, and this is what I did. No, what I look at is the people who had a track record of showing videos of them in the hospital with the doctors and what was happening, or they were on the news. So, you know, you know they were actually coronavirus victims with a positive test. But you can look at them and you can see the case history. Um, you can, you know, they'll describe what they felt like, what was happening. I watched uh, one gentleman, actually. He uh, he was in his 50s. Um, not the really high-risk group, but he was practically an athlete. Perfectly good health, never did drugs, didn't smoke, didn't drink, didn't do anything. Had good lungs, was, you know, a really good heart rate, you know, 40 beats per minute, he said sitting down um you know these are one of those guys that when they go to take the stress test at the cardiologist they're running on that treadmill for three hours to get their heart beats up to 200 beats per minute or whatever it is and i i got on that machine i was like oh. in like five minutes i'm like oh can i stop <laughs> you know please you got this thing in my mouth he gets crap hooked on me and i'm running on the treadmill and i'm like i don't run on treadmills i'm not a cardio guy i'm a a weightlifting guy. I don't mind that, but I don't like cardio other than swimming. That's my cardio. I like to swim. I don't like running. I got bad joints. Doesn't work for me. Bad knees, bad back. Uh, but in water, I'm weightless. Works for me. But, uh, but yeah, no, he, uh, he went the bad way. He ended up really close. The doctors were, you know, telling him to pray and there was nothing they could really do. And they didn't fully understand it at that point either. So, you know, yeah, it was uh, it was a pretty pretty crazy thing. But he overcame it. And one of the things that I paid attention to. Now I don't know if this works, but I'll tell you, if I got sick like that, I'm definitely going to try it. Um, he actually said that when he laid down, and I've heard this from several of these people, that they feel like crap. They got the fever. They got the headache. They got this and that. You know, they, but when they laid down, it was like, oh, it felt so good. Everything went away. The fever died down. The headache died down. And they just felt good to lay there. So it's almost like uh, I've heard this corroborated from a whole bunch of these patients that this is what it feels like. They feel better when they lay down and rest. But at the same time, their oxygen saturation is going down slowly as this stuff crystallizes in their lungs and turns to like glass. So even though they feel better, they're getting less and less and less and less oxygen until they're on a ventilator. And even then they're getting less and less and less and less oxygen. 
Now, what he described, which is something that a lot of doctors are reporting in the medical community, and it starts with a G, like garot or gar- garages, or I can't even remember what it is. It's a weird term I've never heard of, but to describe like an attack that happens. And these people, you know, when they finally get up out of the bed and they stand up and try to do something, immediately the fever goes up, the headaches come back, the you know, fatigue, the pain, the, you know, miserableness hits them. They, they're, uh, mm. their breath, they lose half their air. They describe it as like half of whatever they had left is gone right away and they can barely get their breath. They can't breathe. And, um, but they go through this. And now what he described in particular was how he kept getting up and he made the nurses promise him that they were going to make sure he got up out of bed, no matter how much he begged and make him get up and move around and exercise and do things to keep himself flowing. And, uh, that might be how he recovered. I can't say that'll work for everybody, but, uh, it may be a very big contributing factor for him. And just from my own experiences with colds and flus and things like that, when I laid around, I felt sicker. I got worse. Um, you know, when I got up, stayed busy and breathe, go out, do yard work, you know, swim, you know, I did things to keep my cardiovascular, my blood flowing faster, my oxygen flowing better. I felt better and I felt better quicker from doing that. And I always lived by that. That's why, you know, anybody who's ever worked with me at work or things like that, or known me knows that if, Hey, if he's laying home at, in bed at home, he probably needs to go to the hospital. He's in really bad shape. Like I get sick. I am not, you know, a man flu guy. I am. I try to keep going and do something, you know, cause it helps. It really does. Um, if you lay around, I feel sicker. Um, everything seems to get worse congestion and sinuses and whatever. Um, so I kind of, it hit me with him because I I've experienced that, uh, not the part where I feel better when I lay down, but kind of feels like that virus is doing something where you start to feel better because you're laying down, but it's actually killing you even more. And if you get up and you keep your lungs expanding and contracting and you keep exercising, you know, keep your blood flowing that you might recover. Um, I believe there's probably some weight in that. Again, this is my opinion. Do your own research, figure it out, but it's worth a try. If you're sitting there dying in the hospital bed, and the doctors are telling you to pray. What can you lose? Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, that was the thing I was, I was, you know, looking at that as, you know, that might be why this guy lived and, uh, he was one of the ones in really bad shape about to go on a respirator and, um, he came back from it. And yeah, it's, I think it's a good thing. Um, but yeah, that description of laying down and feeling better, weird. And then, uh, but the panic thing or the, the attack that they go through, I mean, it was described, several people described it, including him, which was, you know, the they get up, they feel they lose half of whatever air they were able to get laying down. Now they can only get half of it. Everything hits them harder. The fever, the, the, the headaches, you know, whatever the symptoms are, like back, you know, major. And they just feel really, 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 really bad. And then they start throwing up and everything. And like, almost like panic attacks are happening at the same time while they go through it. And, uh, he said this goes on for about 20 to 30 minutes for him. Other people described it as as long as, you know, 45 minutes to an hour, but it seems to subside after they've been up and moving around. So they go through this attack and once it seems to release, they get their lung capacity back more and they're able to, you know, function. So, um, and then, you know, stay up do junk and jumping jacks or something, you know, move around, stay busy. Um, uh, I've heard people, some doctors say, you know, rest and drink lots of water, but I don't know from what I heard in those instances from a lot of those patients that the ones who got up and moved around seemed to 
seem to fare a little better. <sighs> or come back from the dark side, at least. Sorry, it's very late right now. Uh, I've been up really early this morning. So now I'm in an hour on this video. So. Uh, let me think of those other things. Oh, well, one little side thing. So if you don't have any gloves, you can't get your hands on gloves. Freezer, Ziploc bag, Ziploc bag, whatever. Um, anything would be better to put over your hand before you touch outside stuff than, um, than nothing. Anything is better than nothing. Uh, so you don't have one of these. So make your own with cloth. And I'm not talking a bandana. I'm talking going, you know, several layers of cloth. Um, make it with that. Um, you want it, again, where you put the lighter in front and <coughs> or blow. And you can't blow the lighter out through it. Now, one thing about these that people get to understand these are not just to protect you from other people. This is also so that if you have the virus, you're not going to spread it. Now, you can actually have the virus up to 14 days, they've been saying at the CDC, before you show the first symptom. And in that time frame, you can be infectious. So you wearing this, and you know that little, oh, I have a little allergy cough or a smoker's cough or something. Yeah. <clears throat> that right there could have just spread it to everybody around you so this protects the others around too and if we all do it even if it's not a store-bought one like this uh, one little side note is you can go to uh, you know like Home Depot an air conditioning store and in the AC aisle you can get like an 8 micron um, I mean, it'll work better than anything. Eight or ten micron, uh, if it gets better, like a four micron filter, grab them. Um, you can tear the paper part that's inside out. Tear that out. The micron filters, anti. Some of those are even antibacterial. And you could actually, you know, stitch that in between two pieces of regular cloth and get a lot more protection out of that. Um, if you're stitching it in. And you can, you know, put a little something metal in the middle inside the cloth that you're stitching so that you can bend it to get a tighter fit to your nose. Great. If you can't, you know, we understand. So, but, you know, anything that's wrapped around your face is better than nothing. Um, reusing them, things like that. If, if you got cloth ones you made, it's cotton or whatever it is. Throw it in the washing machine. Detergent kills coronavirus. Uh, by the time you put it through a wash and dry, it's dead. So just throw it in there. Let it wash. Uh, anything's better than nothing, right? And uh, so, yeah, wear something. Social distancing. This whole six-foot thing. I'm trying to stay ten or more feet away from everybody. And, in fact, at this point, I'm completely isolated. If the mailman comes up to my door, I'm like, leave it over there by the street, dude. You know, I don't even come in the driveway. You know, it's like, I don't want anybody anywhere near. Um, just in case I was sleeping or not, you know, paying attention or I wasn't here or something. Somebody came up to my door, maybe opened the door or knocked on the door. I disinfect my doorknobs. I disinfect my screen. I, you know, I just, just in case, because, you know. I didn't see somebody come up and knock and they tried my screen door and knocked and didn't hear me, whatever. I was taking a shower or something and they walked away and they had touched my doorknob and I come out thinking nobody's been here and I touched my doorknob. So I disinfect anything that could be exposed to the public. Um, yeah, I know this all sounds crazy to some, but if you really want to go without getting this virus and you want to have a 99% chance of not getting it, just stay the hell home. You don't have to wait on an order from the state to do that. Stay home. Um, you know, if you get laid off from your job, we have in America right now, we have unemployment and things that are coming in for people. I know the websites are hard to get through, but you'll get there. Um, hopefully you have a little money put away and you can afford to, you know, stock your fridge with canned or stock your shelves with canned food. And do some of these things so that you can remain at home as long as possible without leaving the house. 
you know, pop on your TV, surf the internet, make some wild YouTube videos, you know, you can make money on YouTube. I tell people that all the time. I get paid by YouTube every month. I haven't even really put up anything in years. I'm still getting paid by YouTube. Monthly income. Um, but yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, you can start a revenue stream online, drop shipping, you know, start, decide to clean your house and get, do some spring cleaning. It's spring right now. Anyway, um, find stuff to sell, you know, and uh, ah, we don't need this anymore and sell it on eBay or something. You know, there's a lot of things you can do. Um, but, uh, I understand some people have, you know, really strain on money. There are people out there trying to help you. I know here in Palm Beach County, we have a guy named Rodney Mayo. He's a restaurant bar owner, uh, very successful, been around a long time here. He's a man of the town, everybody, a lot of people know him. And he started up a non-for-profit out there feeding, you know, free meals to people who are unemployed right now. And he's been doing that for a while. He even got a, a bit of a grant from the uh, mayor of West Palm Beach. Kudos to him. Um, he gave him a nice little chunk of change to help continue this. And I hope it progresses more. I know there's a lot of families out there right now that need it. I know a lot of the schools are serving school lunches for the kids and stuff. You got to go and pick it up. Um, if you had to feed your kid, you had to feed your kid. At least they're at lower risk of getting, you know, the serious complications, but I don't want to touch anything. Anybody's touching. <laughs> even the packaging the food comes in uh i just find anything like that too high risk right now uh, i know of course the food prepping they're probably wearing gloves and masks and hair nets and whatnot but this virus is pretty serious and uh yeah so um but yeah the the that that's a really good thing that they're doing rodney mayo and the mayor of west palm beach did that here in florida um you know, they're, yeah, I, my hat's off to people like that. You guys make a big difference for these families. A lot of people, I mean, there's always going to be people are going to take advantage of a, of a hospital, of a system like that. But, you know, even for the few that come through that don't need it and are taking it and whatnot, there's always, even if there's just a few that really need it, they really need it. And anybody who's had, you know, trouble with money and tight times and has kids, you understand that, you know, um, I witnessed a, uh, a mother one time getting, you know, cornered at a grocery store and the police came up and she was trying to steal food, uh, baby formula and stuff for her kids. She had a baby with her and two kids in tow. Um, she was an immigrant and she didn't really speak good English and, couldn't really communicate with the law enforcement that was there, anybody. They knew she had taken some food and different stuff. Uh, it wasn't like anything, you know, extravagant. Why she's grabbing lobster or anything. She was grabbing basic things like a bag of rice and some beans and uh, a little bit of pork. And uh, I think she had a little chicken. She was like, trying to put it in her purse and, and walk out or whatever. But she had two kids in tow, and what I gathered was pretty much her her husband had, I wasn't quite sure, because my Spanish dialect wasn't that good at the time, um, a little better now, but I wasn't quite sure if she was trying to explain he passed away, or he left her, or something, I don't know, and she pretty much was taking care of the three by herself, and uh, I overheard this kind of going on from a distance, and uh, so I went over and talked to the law enforcement that was there, I kind of knew some of the officers prior from that uh that area and uh i agreed to buy her you know what it was she wanted and um and even more i'd fill a cart for her and i think that embarrassed the store manager who was acting pretty uh pretty bad at the moment about it you know some people stealing you know yeah i get it but this didn't you could tell this wasn't that kind of thing. She was scared and trying to feed her children. And uh, it's not like she was wearing all flashy jewelry or anything. You know, she was very dressed meagerly. I could tell she didn't have money. And uh, wasn't a drug addict or anything. 
and uh, the manager then, you know, when I came up to the register with a cart full of stuff with her to pay, uh, law enforcement was there. I think he felt bad, and, or not felt bad, but I think he was embarrassed. So he decided to give her the, the she, and here's the thing, I was going to fill the cart and I was explaining that to her, anything you want. And uh, she didn't. She took, and even then, somebody willing to pay for it, she wasn't trying to go out and grab big steaks and things like that. She was grabbing rice and beans, a lot of that, um, some chicken, a little bit of pork, you know, like she was still trying to be very meager about it and just needed enough to make some meals for a week or so, you know, like she wasn't, she didn't even, even put a half a cart. I mean, I'm exaggerating. She, she didn't put that much in there. And, uh, yeah, so it's what it is. Um, uh, always try to help people when you can. Um, but yeah, Rodney Mayo is definitely, you're a winner in my book, dude. Uh, you've been for a long time. I've known a lot of charitable things you've done and a lot of things you've done for the community. Uh, the mayor of West Palm Beach, thank you very much. Uh, there's a town councilman who's, who's really good too in uh, the county. Um, yeah, so we've got you know a lot going on here. So all right, everybody, uh, stay safe. Um, maybe I'll do another video in the future of other protocols and ways of doing things. Um, do your research, make sure, you know, if you're going to take something seriously before you take a chance and hurt yourself, I've seen people post an online 40% alcohol is just as good. It's not, um, it really is not. And I've seen them post a 99% works faster, right? No, actually it works the opposite. <laughs> Or slower it takes longer to disinfect the area um, so yeah these these things do your research on each you know, even just these basic products alcohol barbicide um, peroxide and you can just so you guys know you can still buy barbicide and pretty cheaply on Amazon or anything like that because people haven't figured this out now that they see my video it's kind of fly off the shelves but barbicide works great uh, kills a lot of bacteria and viruses and you know molds and then fungicide and everything. It's 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 a viricide, a fungicide, everything. So it's a germicide. It's it's a really good product, and um, it takes longer exposure times, of course, but it works. Um. Yeah. So that's just what it is. And uh, also read the instructions on anything you're getting. Read the label very clearly. Um, Lysol works, um, you know, for killing germs and things like that. Uh, if you have no toilet paper, come on, people. Why are you hoarding toilet paper? It's not like coronavirus is attacking your butt. Um, come on, man. Give it a break, people. Toilet paper. Um, so, just so you know, you can still kind of find commercial toilet paper, which is kind of stocked up right now in uh, warehouses and stuff like that. You know, the big rolls you'd see in like a gas station, it's one ply, it's kind of rough. It's not the stuff you used to use in at home. But the weirdest thing is that the commercial toilet paper industry is actually right now suffering because nobody's buying their toilet paper. And most commercial businesses like restaurants, places like that are closed to the public right now. So they've got that stockpiled. But the plush, cushy stuff that we like to use at home is being taken off the shelves in a retardedly fast manner. Um, so, in all honesty, here in Florida, they should have put a one pack per customer thing. I saw that in Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, that whole area. I was just up there uh, back in uh, the beginning of March till about the middle of March, and I had to do some work up there, uh, looking at, uh, job sites and stuff for our company. And while I was up there going around, I had, I ended up having to drive back because my, uh, flights kept getting canceled on my return flight from Logan to West Palm beach. But I already kind of knew 
I didn't, I'd rather not. So I just took the rental car and drove back. I had the rental car the whole time with me. So it was clean. And, uh, luckily it was a hybrid. I got like 500 miles to a 10 gallon tank. And, uh, when I had to go through New York or, <laughs> you know, Jersey places at that time that had a much higher infection rate, no stopping, not even for gas. Uh, when I did stop for gas, though, I knew right away what a lot of people didn't understand. Gas pumps or anything that the public is touching regularly, the door on a gas station, you know, they grab that door. Grabbing that gas pump, you know, put the ATM, you know, hitting in your numbers. These are high contact areas. These are things that get touched a lot these are the really dangerous things to touch. Gas pumps probably spread so much coronavirus, it's not funny. Wear gloves. You know, there's a garbage can right there, too. You can put the glove on. Put a put your hand in a Ziploc bag. Where did I put that? Put your hand in a Ziploc bag. It's not rocket science. Do this. Even if you got a little bag. I got big hands, people. This is a sandwich bag. Grab the gas pump. Put it in. Remember, one hand exposure, one hand clean. Put it in. Punch your code in or whatever you're doing, you know. Fill up your tank. Put it back. Then take this off and drop it in the garbage. Okay. So, oh, and I did forget to tell you about gloves. I started to mention that and I got sidetracked. Sorry, a little ADHD, I guess. Um, so glove removal. So you got your two gloves. Imagine they're both contaminated hands. Of course, whichever hand you write with, right or left, is going to be your most contaminated hand naturally because that's the hand you touch everything with usually. But imagine they're both. How do I get my gloves off? Oh, man. You know, you go to pull them this way. You're trying to slide them off your fingertips and they just won't slide. You know, you're like, oh, and I don't want to rip it and expose my skin. Or all this, how do I do it? Okay, and then some people teach you I actually had somebody in the medical field was telling me out of nowhere decided they were going to educate me on removal of gloves. Oh, yeah, this is how you do it. You take this hand, gloved hand, and you put your middle finger underneath the glove and you slide it up the palm and pull them off like that. Then you put this one under there and you slide it up and pull it off like that. scary so yes i have hair people not that it's really brushed right now <laughs> but uh yeah so that is improper so the way i remove gloves i take my highly infected hand and i grab the glove here in the middle of the palm i bunch it you know cup your hand a little bit to loosen it grab that Try to loosen it up that way and pull this way. If you can get a little bit of gap going there, a lot of times the fingers will slide off easier and slide. If you got powdered gloves, they'll slide off easier. I mean, that's true. But um, get that under there and then work your fingers. Work, work, work. And once you get it, you'll be able to slide it off that way. Then take the infected glove, throw it in the garbage. Not in the shopping cart. Not on the sidewalk. Not anywhere, but a garbage can. Jeez, people. I'm getting posts. I saw this on the news. I saw this on, you know, videos on YouTube. And now my friends are posting it. They're like, oh, I went out to the grocery store today. And look at the carts. There was like eight gloves. People, are you that disgusting? Seriously? You know, and... If you have a crappy, crappy glove, I get it. But some of the heavy gloves like I have, I have some much heavier gloves. Um, surgical gloves. I have completely sterile surgical gloves, too. I use for if I had to do an emergency medical procedure on somebody who you know, surgery of some type. Um, that's in my bug out bag and medi my medical bug out bag and, and uh, emergency bag for, like I said, I'm a prepper. Shoot me. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I had to remove a bullet or something, then I would take these out. They come individually sealed, and you open it up, and then you put, the, you know, have your hands scrubbed, and you put the gloves on. Um, 
But anyway, slide that one off like that. Now then, you could, as long as it was, you know, you're sure you didn't contaminate this part of your glove, you could reach up under then and kind of get that slide like that and push them off um, and remove them that way. Another way, though, is once you <clears throat> pull this one off, you leave just a couple fingers inside and you grab the other one and do the same thing. You can do it both ways. Just be real cautious of it. And then the number one most important thing of glove removal, after you remove the gloves, wash your hands. Got hand sanitizer, alcohol, peroxide, whatever. Now, oh God, here's another one. Geez, I could go on all day about this. I'm already at two, an hour and 20 minutes. Um, I've had a lot of people talking about they can make hand sanitizer out of this. Oh, I just take the, even the 99% stuff and I mix it with uh, lotion. It's not how it's made. Uh, oh, I, I take this and I mix it with gelatin and, you know, I add some scent to it. And it Don't try to make hand sanitizer. And I know this very, very well. One of my clients makes the stuff. Um, and I'm privy to the process and this is something done in like a lab. <laughs> you ain't making hand sanitizer at home willy nilly. Okay. I don't care what recipes you're looking up where, um, you can make something similar to a real hand sanitizer. I don't know if it'll have the effectiveness, but here's the, everybody's like, well, it's drying out my hands. I'm pouring alcohol on my hands. It's drying out my hands. Okay. All right. This ain't hard to understand. Pour the alcohol in your hands. Yep. Yeah. Well, I'll do it right here in front of you. Put a little squirt of alcohol on your hand. And remember, you can contaminate the bottle, just so you know that. Clean, you know, rub it all over your hands real good in between your fingers. Get it all over up your wrists, on your fingertips, especially these guys. And I even add a little more and then I dose the bottle every now and then and I clean the bottle itself. Common vessel. So, let it dry. You know, completely dry on your hands. You know, it's drying out my skin. Okay. After it's completely dried and you've given it a little time, you know, give it a minute or two. Let it, you know, completely kill whatever was on your hands. Take a little lotion and put it on your hand and wipe your hand down with lotion. Put a little Lubriderm on your hands. You know, whatever lotion you like. And that'll soften the skin back. It ain't rocket science. You don't have to have hand sanitizer to do that. You can use the chemical like this and still get your hands clean and moisturize them. It's not hard. Um, and now I just, I lost it. There was something that I was thinking about when this came up about hand sanitizers and all that stuff. Uh, what was it? Another completely wrong thing I've been seeing circulating. Uh, you know, crap about, uh, uh, drink warm water. Uh, do this, do that, do this, that. I mean, I, I drink room temperature water, period, actually. It's better for hydration because you'll drink more. When you have ice cold water, you're not going to drink as much as you will if it's room temperature. You'll consume more water if you drink it at room temperature. And uh, my wife taught me that, actually, and I realized it's true. I drink more water when I drink it at room temperature. If I drink ice cold water, I don't drink as much. But, uh, now there was something, something like that. One of those things that I've been seeing circling the internet and the web telling you that you're gonna, you know, ooh, you're, you're gonna do something or you can use this to do something or something as something crazy, but there, uh, and again, get your information from the sources, treatment, stuff like that. Look on the CDC website. 
for recommendations. Uh, I heard somebody peddling around that you use black tea. Black tea with lime juice in it kills coronavirus. So if you're feeling sick, you just drink that and swish it around your mouth. You know, I get a, a citric acid might be a little helpful, but I, you know, I don't know. And that's the thing. And I don't see anything on the CDC or anybody. I don't even see any doctors, real doctors. And, you know, John Hopkins, you know, Harvard, Yale, any of these places, uh, Stanford, any of them coming out saying, oh, yeah, you know, citrus is working on coronavirus. I think it's too early to tell. Uh, testing, testing. So here's the thing. Um, so testing in the United States has to be approved by the FDA. We only have, as of right now, one rapid test that's been approved. Uh, there's a company in North Carolina, I know, that supposedly announced they had approval and we're doing, but then said, then the FDA said, no, you don't, or something. I don't know. I'm watching that right now. Anyway, so just so you know, those FDA tests are going to be held for the medical community as they should. Doctors and people who are experienced and recognizing the symptoms and testing, while we have a limited supply of FDA approved tests, should be going to hospitals and, and medical providers. I believe in that. You know, they're not going to willy nilly test. I mean, there's people out there who would buy a hundred tests and do them all in a week, every few hours. Oh, I got to tickle. I'm going to take another test. Um, and that's a hundred tests that didn't go out to people who might actually need it to prove whether they have coronavirus or not. So yes, don't mess with the tests being produced like that. You're not going to get your hands on them anyway. Um, everybody's fighting to get their hands on them and that's the states, the medical boards, to, you know, all of them are after them. So you ain't getting them, the federal government. Now, if there's an availability of them, if you do your research research there are and this is something that's advertised through the CDC and everything you can you can actually get this information of what tests are in the pipeline right now for FDA approval and you can also see where they have been approved now as an electrician electrical engineer I see this all the time with products that we approve by UL listing or we accredit and accept certain laboratories for testing in America. Now, the National Fire Protection Act, the NFPA, also knows the NEC 70 and stuff that we follow. There's a whole bunch of different ones, but just to make it simple, the NFPA. Um, the accepted ones for the United States are like UL, CA, you know, stuff like that. The different laboratory testing. Uh, and we say that, yes, this lab we approve to test products for light fixtures, breakers, panels, whatever, because they do the stringent testing that our NFPA requires, okay, that our government asks for in these products. Um, so they're approved, and there's only so many of them, right? Some, some years you can count them on one hand, some years it takes two hands. But these are the labs that are allowed to do this testing. Um, but other countries are different. So let's say China. China may have a test who is currently in the pipeline to be used in America. And this could be Germany, France, you know, any place they're doing these making tests. Um, so you can get a test out of, let's say China. And let's say their infection rates went way down. Of course, they're but here's the funny thing. So let's say America was the last one with coronavirus and everybody else is pretty much cured. Well, everybody else is making these tests. If the FDA hasn't approved them, well, we're not buying them. They're not coming here for medical use. They're not coming here for federal use because they're not FDA approved yet. They may be on fast track for approval and testing under our laboratories to approve whether they can be used against the coronavirus or not. But they're not yet approved. Therefore, Sometimes you will see that there is an availability of these tests. Now, there's a lot of different tests, lots of different ways tests are done. Some require laboratory equipment, centrifuges, blood draws, serum, you know, separation with a centrifuge, require, you know, microscopes, require special uh, uh, 
readers, which can cost thousands on thousands of dollars for that reader. Um, I've worked in a laboratory environment before. I'm very familiar with processes of testing on certain things. Um, so a lot of people aren't equipped to be able to do some of these tests. These are not simple things you're going to do. Um, and nobody should be drawing their own blood unless they're a phlebotomist or actually have some training on what they're actually doing because you can really make, you can hurt yourself. You can, you can get an infection, then go septic and kill you. Um, you know, cleaning the area properly alone is probably the most critical thing. Uh, and then the needle you're using and everything being hygienic. Um, so there are tests though. Now, the particular test I recommend if somebody wants to try to get their hands on one is an RDT test. That's a rapid diagnostic test. And it's pretty, uh, so some of them you get to read through are pretty easy to use. And they could be improve, approved for use already in most of Europe, in China, most of Asia, you know, the Middle East. They've been approved already in like the rest of the world. But in North America, we have not approved them. The FDA still has not approved them for use. Canada has approved them for use. You know, so you get a look. You know, Germany approved them for use. France approved them for use. The UK approved them for use. Canada approved them for use. Then you get a look at the uh, the test results and testing. A lot of the companies advertise what the tests are, 96% accurate. Or if they're two, testing two antigens, you know, 96 and 100, this antigen's harder to test for, so it only gets a 96. This one's pretty easy to find in blood, so it's, you know, some of these tests require whole blood. They're going to be the easiest. Whole blood means you don't need a centrifuge. You don't have to separate the white blood cells, the serum, or anything like that. Um, all you got to do is just take the blood. Now, blood draw not for the uneducated. Um, again, I, I don't find it terribly difficult to do because I'm actually trained. But the layman who has no real medical training or experience should not mess around intravenous. Um, but there's a very simple thing that most people can do, and that's a diabetic finger picker. And uh, so the RDT tests that are being done, some of these can be are considered done at home. You can do them in a the lab, whatever. Um, it's a rapid diagnostic test, and it's a whole blood test. That's what you're looking for. And you can just prick your finger. And these things look like little pregnancy test cards. Now, the best ones are always going to be a three-line indicator, so they have a control plus the two lines. And uh, you would prick your finger, squeeze it, drop a little bit of blood in, and uh, instead of like, uh, sometimes they, maybe they come with a little swab that you could use to put it on or a little, just like you would the, the little stick on the, um, on the uh, test, test strips for diabetes. Um, but a lot of them are just going to be the finger prick and drop a, drop a blood in there and, and uh, put it in a little hole like you would the pee when you're doing a pregnancy test. And instead of pee, it's blood. And you give it however the time is, read the instructions, 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever it is, and it should read. Um, those tests, since they're not going to be available for American use yet, they may be fast-tracked and in the pipeline, but they're not approved yet. And if the countries they're coming out of aren't really in the dire need of the test yet because they've you know hit their curve and they're on the downslope and they're doing pretty good and they've had plenty of tests grab them you know if you can get them get them you can order them now you got the manufacturer and unless you've got an EIN and a corporation and business that deals in these kind of things you're probably not going to be able to buy direct off of them but what you can do is you can go onto their website a lot of them have English translated websites and you can actually look for their distributors and their distributors who they sell them through to the public or whoever some tests are not sold to the public. Now, in these instances, you may be able to contact your primary physician and tell them you want these tests and you're willing to pay for them. Will the physician get them? Physician's physician may say, okay, but I require that I do it. You know, I do the finger prick and everything. That's fine. Let them do it. 
But uh, if you want to test, you know, that that's a way you could possibly get a test. Then you get into, you know, spectrum cards and things like that. You need, you know, a lot more lab equipment, shaker tables, things like that. Um, microscopes, uh, lasers, like there's all kinds of different types of tests. But um, the one that I'm most interested in is the antigen tests that are that are developed. Um, there's a lot that are developed and approved for other countries already, but not in America yet. Um, and these are, and they varying levels of competency, but, um, the big thing to me is the test that can show you whether you've already had it or not, not whether I have it currently, which that's important too, for people who are sick. But if I'm not sick, but what if I was sick, you know, two months ago, and this is a funny thing back in mid February, early February, yeah, mid February, um, one of the people I work with his wife returned from a trip to Spain, Barcelona. She had spent a few weeks there and she came back with one hell of a respiratory infection. Bedridden her butt for over a week. I know that. And, uh, he got it from her and he came into the office and wiped us out. <laughs> I even had to take a couple days off and that's rare for me. It was, it was a bad respiratory infection. Um, and we had another guy at our office around the same time get hit with type A and type B flu simultaneously. The doctor said, supposedly they tested him for it, but who's to say he didn't have, you know, coronavirus to go with it. That's why it was so bad on him. He ended up, this is a guy like me who never misses time at work and never, ever misses a day at work. So when he's taken off for a week, he's in bad shape, man, you know, and he was running really high fevers. Um, so it's a possibility he had coronavirus too. Um, so we don't know. And she was in Spain during the outbreak that was starting in Spain. And she was in Barcelona, a major city there where it could have been spreading at the time. And right now Spain has a really high infection rate and it was definitely taken off before anybody knew it. Uh, same thing with Italy. And, uh, yeah, so we may have been infected already. Now, it would be really nice for me to know that Ooh, because I infected my household with it, I think. My son got a little bit of a cough. He didn't have many symptoms. My mother got it, um, had it for about three weeks, pretty bad coughs and chest congestion, things like that, shortness of breath. Not really fever with her. Davin got a fever. Um, but, uh, yeah, some of the symptoms were there and I know they vary from person to person. So, and these people are asymptomatic, so they're not going to show any symptoms, even though they had it. So an antigen test to show that you've been exposed already or not is very important to me. And I think, you know, it would be a very good thing to put in place right now, um, it's got to get through the FDA, but, you know, if you want to order these, I'm working on that right now, sourcing them from out of the country and having them shipped in. Um, I have a little bit of link linkage where I can actually probably order right from the manufacturers, but uh, right now I'm not getting really any returns from my emails to them, uh, and I'm contacting them in uh, China, Germany, Sweden, a couple other places. Um but uh, I think the manufacturer is just really busy. So I'm going to go to the distributor route. Um, but I think I have licensing in place that uh, should be able to allow me to access these tests uh, at a manufacturing level, possibly. Um, or from anybody, a distributor or whatnot. Uh, I think I have a medical license to back me. And... Um, incorporations and stuff like that that I can pull on to get this done so I'm actually my thing is I'm trying to make a small order like a hundred pack of tests see they come in 40 50 100 uh, different companies different amounts I'm trying to get the rapid tests in 100 count if I have to go with serum testing and actual card testing and stuff like that with blood draws and all that stuff I can do that um, I worked in a lab enough to understand protocols on how to do all that stuff. 
and uh, they pretty much come with the explanation on you know how long they need to shake and you know what antigens you got to put in what order and all. But um, you do have to have some practical lab knowledge to to know how the process goes. But I have some of that, so um, if I have to, I will go to to uh, you know more involved testing if I can get my hands on the tests. I'm working on that right now. So if I can get that, it would be very nice. And then I can, if I can rule out my family and the people I work with, then we can get back to work. There's a catch. Um, research hasn't been done yet. We don't know how fast this virus will mutate and be able to reinfect you. you know, like the flu could take a year, has to mutate through, you know, pass from person to person to person before it's kind of unrecognizable enough to come back and reaffect you because your white blood cells kind of your uh, antibodies kind of forget or don't not forget but they're like eh, I don't really recognize that guy one thing i notice with things like the flu you know if you get them like every year or two the effects don't seem to be as bad but if you go 10 years with the flu and then you get it again bam it's hitting you hard and uh that's because the virus has mutated so much in that, you know, circling the globe, going through thousands of people, that when you get reinfected, your immune system does not recognize the virus as much. So it's almost like a whole new virus to it. So then it reinfects you. And, you know, if your immune system is fresh up and sees the, you know, and knows the signature of, of that virus, right when that virus comes in, it goes to work eating it. It knows right where to find it. It's like, boom, you're done. But uh, that's why we don't get reinfected right away with the same thing over and over and over. Um, there's multiple colds and flus and things that are going around. So you get hit with two flus in one year. Well, it's type A, type B. You know, you're getting a different flu. Uh, you know, the H1N1 stuff and everything and all this stuff. Many different things you can get. Um, strep throat, you know, strep streptococcal strep b whatever whichever strep there's a whole bunch of streps um a b c d e f g h i j k l m p same thing with like hepatitis there's like one a b c d e f g and uh something i didn't realize actually before this actually more than one hiv there's two hiv one and hiv two i was just reading about that recently and uh uh, it's more found in Africa and Portugal and stuff like that. Um, it actually is not as easily transmit, uh, transmitted, and it's a slower progressor. It's not as fast as HIV-1, which is the most prevalent in the world. Um, but it is. Uh, it has been found in most countries. And, but pretty interesting, pretty interesting. It also reacts to the same uh, viral cocktail, or, you know, antiviral medications that uh, HIV-1 does. So I was surprised to find that out. Then, uh, yeah, I, I never even realized. Who knew? Two HIVs. Um, but yeah, that's why I value researching and taking the time to read things and learn about different stuff. And you want to get really scared. Uh, people that are older, more my age or older, you know, we grew up with the uh, the dirty STDs you could count on your fingers, you know. You know, clap, you know, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, HIV, you know, uh, general warts, crabs, you know. It, it was just a certain number of things, you know. And now, man, I was looking recently at that stuff and I was just like, there's like f over 50 STDs now and like stuff I've never even heard of. You know, I mean, and some of these are lifelong permanent STDs. And I'm like, hmm, definitely, definitely becoming a virgin again. I think I'm going to be a monk. Uh, you read some of this stuff and it, it is horrifying. Uh, like just the fact that HPV alone, you know, they're saying by like 2030, like, pretty much the entire world, anybody who's sexual by 2030 is going to be HPV infected. Wow. You know? Um, yeah, that's... And that's the same 
uh, base viral family that gives you genital warts, but it can have many different forms. Um, but yeah, I was just like, wow, man, all these viruses, and I'm saying 50, but this is probably more than that. I mean, I was just a new name every time I learned, what the hell is that? I've never heard of this. And I start reading about these different ones and trick a something or other and sif or sign up something or other. And I'm just, wow. Um, scary thing is things like syphilis. Um, we can wipe syphilis out in a generation. No problem. Shit. Probably in five years. Um, it only lives in humans. It can't live outside the human body. You can't go, you know, ran some blood or semen or something on a windowsill and somebody touch it five minutes later or a toilet so you can get it. Don't work like that. Um, and if it's easily curable with penicillin G and shot in the butt. Um, and the funny thing was, if we had like some global worldwide mandatory testing or something, we could wipe that thing out in no time. If you mandatorily tested everybody in the world, let's say every six months, within the year or two, you could literally wipe an entire STD off the map. There would never be another case of syphilis. It's that easy. Really? Like, I'm amazed. I get it. You can't force people to do things, but we force people to do things all the time. You know, you want a driver's license? You're getting a syphilis test. I recommend everybody go out and get tested for syphilis. I mean, it's not hard. It's an easy test. It's a rapid test. You can do it at home. There's rapid tests you can do at home for this stuff. Uh, get tested for syphilis. You don't know. You could be carrying that stuff for 10 years. The girlfriend you had 10 years ago that, or boyfriend or, you know, and had no idea. Be infecting everybody you're with, for, you know, down the road and end up with neurosyphilis and then end up, you know, Al Capone died of, you know, you're going crazy, losing your mind, your vision, your hearing, your can't walk, you're crippled. <clears throat> Scary stuff, man. Um, some people are asymptomatic with it too and go the whole time without any symptoms until their heart fails or their liver. Scary. Um, so yeah, uh, learn about infectious disease, um, learn about viruses, do a lot of reading about how viruses are communicated, how they spread, um, and just how germs infect people. Um, and learn a few things, uh, a little bit of chemistry, understanding how these things work, uh, do your research, and stay safe. Uh, hope you guys learned something new that you might not have already known. Or, you know, if you have any comments too, you can put them down there in the comment section of anything I didn't bring up. And, uh, if you're posting things like rubbing broccoli all over your testicles is going to cure coronavirus, you're probably not going to get a reply from me. I am a busy guy, honestly, and I don't always get time to follow up on every little thing. But when I can, I will. And if I see your comments, I'll comment back, or especially if you have something good too, um, a good tip or suggestion, and even if not for me. For the other people watching the video and reading the comments, again, don't trust anything you guys see. Do your own research. It could be a doctor. Well, I'm a doctor, and I'm telling you this and this and this and this. Ninety percent of that crap, they're not even real doctors. But the sad thing, like I said, there was that one recently, and I was just blown away. This was a real practicing doctor with his own practice. And he did not know that there is more than one coronavirus, more than one virus in the coronavirus family and had a whole conspiracy theory built around it. And I was just like, yeah, I'm never going to you, dude. <laughs> You're not too stupid to be a doctor. Jesus. With all that education, you think they'd learn something. Uh, but yeah, it just goes to show you, just because you got a diploma doesn't mean you know anything. I know undocumented, you know, guys that are just 
you know, men and women that are just really, really intellectually smart. They comprehend things very, very well. And they don't need a diploma to go with it. And then I know people with diplomas who don't know Jack and can't solve a simple thing. Uh, and I know people with diplomas who can, who are very intelligent, very well educated, and very smart. Uh, education is always a great thing in any way, shape, or form. Um, but uh, yeah, so just always research what you what you hear, just evaluate it for yourself, weigh it against kind of what you know too, and uh, make an educated opinion. That's what it is. All right, guys. This is late as hell. I've got almost two hours into this, an hour and 50 minutes. Um, going to this think real quick. Split second if I had anything else I want to show you guys. I don't know. I'll think of it later. It's late as hell. And I am exhausted at this point. So go watch a little news before I go to bed. And uh, it's an hour. Chuck D. How do I stop this thing?